my pleasure to introduce Mayor Bertina. As we all know, he was born and raised here in Hamilton, and he doesn't need a lot of introduction from me. Thank you, Mayor Bertina. Well, thank you, Victoria, and uh, I know a lot of your uh, colleagues are busy uh, with issues, and I want to say that our power did go out for about two minutes, and I think it was just they were moving the, uh, the grid around. But uh, the first thing I did was turn my gas fireplace on. <laughs> and I understand that uh, lots of people actually had their gas stoves on with uh, water on the, on the burner to, uh, to provide heat. So when we think of you know, evaluating uh, for other eventualities, uh, that might be a, a good thing to think about. This is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a real honor for me to be here. What a spectacular venue. And so many people have uh, not had the advantage of seeing the city from this perspective. We have, uh, of course, an escarpment that you can look over, but the roads themselves, uh, you, it's hard to stop on the Sherman Access somewhere and, and take a look at the scenery. So this is, is such a pleasure to, uh, to be able to show off the city in the context of this speech here. And just before I get into uh, my text, I, I do have to say something about The Spectator, because uh, there was a cartoon that was published. And that cartoon shows me with a sunken chest and a paunch. Now, usually I start speeches like this and I say, the suit that I'm wearing was made in Hamilton, Ontario. And it's true. Uh, this particular one by Stony Creek Tailors, but Copley, which uh, you can see there, beautiful uh, heritage building outside. Uh, they also, uh, I also wear those Copley suits. And they're 42 jackets and 36 pants. So. If someone would like to correct that, I'd appreciate it very much. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is the fourth time it's been my privilege to present the State of the City address, which uh, has been rotated to various key venues throughout the greater Hamilton area. So we started in 2011 at the Chamber's former waterfront offices, and then we went to Flamborough, and last year it was Stony Creek. So here we are today, 21st floor of the Stelco Tower, in the middle of what is arguably one of the most dynamic urban transfer transformations in Canada. You know, Toronto is, is, we're seeing the condos continue to go up, but it's not transformative. That's been going on. Here, something special is happening, and that's why we're all here today. And when I talk about Hamilton, I'm referring to the six distinct downtowns and the smaller individual rural communities that make up our rich, diverse municipality. And I have to say how impressed I was with the resilience shown by Hamiltonians during the recent storm, especially by those in the rural areas where most of the brunt was felt. And I also want to acknowledge the work of our city staff, our hydro workers, our first responders, everyone for the way they got us back to normal as quickly as they did. We had, we had an outage of about 30,000, and uh, within 48 hours, that was down to 7,000. And, and that's why I was not critical of uh, what was happening in Toronto with regard to food cards, because uh, we did tour the city of Toronto at the height of uh, the storm, and it was a terrible disaster and much, much worse than, than I was experiencing here in the Hamilton area. So. Uh, that having been said, media has been doing a good job relaying our impressive economic statistics of the past year. But let me touch briefly on some of the results from 2013, which is a great story on about how staff and council have set us on a path of growth and sound public finances. And so where do we begin? Well, the construction permit picture so much of what is right outside this building. For the second consecutive year and the third time in the past four years, construction activity within the city of Hamilton exceeded the $1 billion mark. 2013 produced $1.03 billion worth of construction with 6,286 building permits issued. 49% of that was industrial, commercial, and institutional. And most importantly, the commercial sector established a new benchmark high of $257 million in construction. That's an increase of 
28% over the previous high, which was set last year in 2012. So what this means is, to our residents, the possibility of lower household taxes by increased revenue from commercial and industrial taxation. And new commercial and industrial permits also means jobs. In the past year, yes. In the past year, we saw permits issued to Toshiba in Stony Creek, and that's their first Canadian manufacturing facility. Stackpole, a leading supplier to the automotive original equipment manufacturers, an 80,000 square foot expansion in Ancaster. Activation Labs building over 200,000 square feet of space for mineral research and testing. Anderson Water Systems, 3,000 systems in 40 countries began in Dundas in 1952, and in their new facility, they'll create 50 new full-time jobs in engineering, production, drafting, trades, and field support in that $5 million facility. In the year since our last state of the city, we have the Pan Am Stadium well underway, the McMaster Downtown Medical Campus rising at the corner of Main and Bay, the 12-story residential development at the old Revenue Canada building, the 16-story Hilton Homewood Suites at Bay and Main, and between the Hilton and the Revenue Canada building, the 25-story Bella Tower condominium project. And of tremendous importance and relief to us all who love the downtown, we are seeing the start of the Royal Connaught condo project. And add to that the New Horizons uh, site on the old Thistle Club at Park and Robinson. One building sold out, second building 90% sold out, and the third building about uh, to see construction. So here's the dollars and cents reason why our uh, loans program, our residential loans program, has been such a success. You can put 10 townhouses on an acre of suburban land. At $4,000 a house, that generates tax revenues of $40,000 a year. The acre or so at Maine between Bay and Caroline will produce almost a million and a half dollars of new taxes on the hotel and the condo buildings. All of that with most of the infrastructure already in place. The So we, of course, need to continue to provide a, a range of uh, housing opportunities. But the impact of these projects downtown, when you look at maybe $40,000 an acre, plus the need to uh, provide infrastructure against $1.5 million an acre with the infrastructure in place, uh, that's a very simple uh, thing to consider. And we now have our first grocery store in our core in 10 years, thanks to the vision and hard work of Frank Ho and Lillian Kwan of Nations Foods in conjunction with Yale Properties. And, by the way, without tapping into the $600,000 of incentives that the city had offered to uh, attract a grocery store downtown. The nation's store opening was another watershed moment of our city. And the bright economic picture I am describing has not gone unnoticed by the rest of the country. The Conference Board of Canada says Hamilton will have the fastest growing economy in the province at 2.5%. Site Selection Magazine for the second year in a row ranked Hamilton number one in attracting industrial and commercial development. Real Estate Investment Network calls Hamilton the best place in Ontario to invest over the next five years, and on it goes. The urbanist Richard Florida published an article last fall in the highly respected Atlantic Magazine showing that more than half of the net new positions created in Hamilton since 2009 paid more than $30 an hour. Only Toronto and Regina could match us. So it's not all about replacing good jobs with low paying service jobs. The Toronto Star, the National Post, the Globe and Mail have all published feature articles on Hamilton's newfound vitality. And locally, the hometown Spectator just published a very pleasing article about the 10 best things about Hamilton. All of this critical 
to putting forward a new positive perception that diminishes the old negative stereotype that has dogged us for decades. We even gained some new fans in the process, such as literary icon Margaret Atwood, leading Canadian columnist on urban issues Christopher Hume, and the grand dame of Canadian ballet Veronica Tennant, ask any of them about their experiences in Hamilton. Canadian artist Ron Eady commands up to $30,000 per work. He moved his studio from Burlington to downtown Hamilton. In fact, just down the street from me, it's, a, it's just an amazing place. There are many, many more projects underway and many other signs of the economic progress our city is making that you can see in the displays that are set up for your information. And I don't know if you had a chance, but please uh, do access the other uh, side of uh, the 21st floor because uh, I think you'll be very pleased with what you see there. Now, we have accomplished this growth while keeping property taxes in check. For two years running, Hamilton has experienced the second lowest tax increase in the province. Our finances are in good shape at the moment, double A stable rating from the bond agencies, although this could change as we consider raising our debt in the next three or four years to tackle major projects like water and wastewater upgrades that are required to service the airport employment growth district, waterfront initiatives, transit, and so on. And personally, I have concerns about any significant increase in debt at this time. With a still uncertain economy and the unprecedented level of interest rates and inflation currently running at around or below 1%, Finance Minister Jim Flaherty is saying Canada will face global pressure to raise interest rates this year as the Americans begin to step back from their policy of extraordinary economic stimulus. Prince Metternich of Austria once said, when France sneezes, Europe catches cold. Guess who catches cold when America sneezes? We do. <clears throat> so we've done well post-recession, but we can't organize our economy in a vacuum, especially with a new Euro trade pact on the horizon. We have to be very wary of a build it and they will come approach to infrastructure spending because we can't afford to get it wrong. Costly infrastructure and employment growth have to take place in tandem. The growth we are experiencing now has occurred where infrastructure already exists, and we need to, take, to continue to take advantage of what we have. It's part of my immigrant family economic policy that I have stressed since becoming mayor. Live within your means, make the most of what you have, do as much as you can for yourself. It has worked for thousands of families, it works for governments and municipalities. And it looks like the province may be catching on to our approach when you read carefully the comments of Ann Golden. She's the former chair of the Conference Board of Canada and current chair of the province's panel on transit funding. And we have representation on that uh, panel with Joe Mancinelli and Pat Dillon. Her recommendation to the Premier on congestion relief was to make better use of existing GO transit lines in the GTA. That same thinking can apply to Hamilton, where GO service is extended as far, and when it is extended as far as Stony Creek. In her report, uh, Golden says transit should not be about ideology. It shouldn't be about drivers versus riders, subway versus light rail, city versus suburb. This is an issue where we can all be on the same side. And later she said, I want to be clear, our strategy is not just about transit. It's about transportation. It's about economics. No major transit project should proceed without compelling evidence that it will serve to ease congestion. Hamilton has received great cooperation from senior governments with our GO expansion, Randall Reef, the stadium, and so on. And make no mistake, the cooperation and easy access has been tremendous. In my opinion, however, a new dynamic needs to be created in how municipalities relate to senior governments. We are the ones closest to the people, whereas much of the money required by us to provide and operate services lies in the hands of provincial and federal governments. Municipal governments tend to be a lot less volatile and subject to change than the others. We have to rebalance this tripartite relationship because their comfort zone involves the top-down approach, which in far too many cases has not worked. And here's an example. 
the biggest imposition of a top-down, or you might say cookie-cutter, solution to municipal governance problems in recent memory was the amalgamations of 2001, created by the provincial government of the day. It is very reasonable and perhaps critical to ask the question more than a decade later, so how has it worked? Dr. Timothy Coban of the University of Western Ontario has just completed a comprehensive review of that policy, and he will present that at a news conference in Hamilton later today. The real takeaway to my mind here is the need to be wary of one size fits all in such matters as the big move, places to grow, and so on. More of our planning needs to be done on a regional basis, and as a matter of fact, we have already embarked on such a path. Hamilton is a lead player in a new coalition of Western GTA municipalities. Hamilton, Niagara, Waterloo and Peel, along with Halton, have formed a municipal caucus called the Western Golden Horseshoe Transportation Trade Network, for short, the Prosperity Alliance, whose mandate is, among other things, to press for a long-term transportation plan involving all three levels of government, a plan that embraces transit, but also recognizes the proven need to improve our road network with projects like the Niagara to GTA and GTA West corridors. The strength of this alliance is that it involves only the municipalities in a specific region where the issues and concerns are shared by all the participants. The 36 federal and provincial representatives in that affected area would be foolhardy to turn their backs on this regional, almost city-state approach, and in fact, I believe they would welcome it. We do have working on our behalf right now the Association of Municipalities of Ontario and the FCM, Federation of Canadian Municipalities, who will continue to carry out their clearly defined roles in advocating on behalf of all municipalities on issues common to all. Within the province are certain distinct areas of influence, such as the Western Golden Horseshoe, which have specific issues separate and apart from Toronto and the GTA, for whom a Toronto-centric solution may not be applicable. For the province to be successful, we as municipalities and regional identities have to succeed, which means ensuring that scarce financial resources are directed to appropriate infrastructure needs. Top down, has to give way to regional planning in the way that I have just described. And Minister Bob Shirelli stated this two years ago at a major transportation speech in Burlington when we heard phrases like interregional and cross-jurisdictional as requirements for future planning. Well, as I mentioned, this is the fourth opportunity that I've had to talk about the state of our city, and it's also the last state of the city address for the current term of council. And I think it's only fair to look at how Council has responded to the issues we faced beginning in December 2010. First, there was the somewhat divisive stadium location debate, which at times challenged the generosity and good nature of Tiger Cat owner, caretaker, Bob Young, uh, and Bulldogs owner Michael Andelauer also had to en endure some contentious times in simply trying to renew his lease at Cops Coliseum. But in both cases, Council came through with good decisions for our professional sports franchises, their fans, and the city as a whole. Both Bob Young and Michael Andelauer have put a lot into this community, and sometimes I don't think they've gotten the marks and the thanks that they deserve. And on the stadium issue, well, I'm sure most of you have driven by Cannon Balsam to see Tim Horton Field which we expect will open on time for the kickoff of the Tiger Cats home opener. Something we can all take pride in is that this beautiful and important facility was accomplished without one additional tax dollar for the cost of its construction. I have reviewed many municipal stadium projects in Canada and the United States, such as Vancouver, Regina, Winnipeg and Ottawa, and I will boldly state that this is the best stadium deal for taxpayers anywhere in North America. Go Transit was another issue. Four years after Council gave me unanimous approval to aggressively pursue Go Train service to a new station at James North, the planning, design, land purchase, and construction is underway.
Our next target needs to be the extension of that service to Stony Creek as soon as possible in conjunction with seamless HSR connections at both ends, and this will substantially change how Hamiltonians move around the city and the GTA. My previous State of the City address called for action to deal with financial and management challenges at HECFI, the Conservation Authority, and the Waterfront Trust, among others. The turnaround at these operations has been remarkable, with all of them posting significant improvements to their balance sheets that favor Hamilton taxpayers. At HECFI, a notable financial sinkhole in the past, Council set it on a new course by privatizing the management of the facilities, engaging with major partners in the entertainment and hospitality business like Global Spectrum, Live Nation, and the Carmen's Group. Look at this year's budget. We're a million dollars better than we were before that change. Randall Reef, for years an environmental black mark against the city of Hamilton. The remediation is now underway with cleanup funding of $138.9 million, a triumph of intergovernmental relations since it needed to bring together the City of Hamilton, the governments of Canada and Ontario, the Hamilton Port Authority, U.S. Steel Canada, and the City of Burlington and Halton Region. We got it done. And remember area rating. This council took on this very divisive issue squarely and came up with a Made in Hamilton solution that passed unanimously, even though many at the time were saying that the council was split down the middle. We made it work. We also achieved labor peace with a four-year collective agreement with city workers that set a pattern for others across the province, including Toronto. We came out with zero, 1.9, 1.9, 1.9, .9, just an amazing result uh, for labor peace with our very valuable outside workers. So we have a lot to be proud of over the past year and the past four years, but we still have issues to work on. If our downtown redevelopment is going to result in a truly livable city, we need to erase the nagging perception that downtown is not a safe place to be, especially after dark. Policing in the city has undergone significant change and improvement with Chief DeCare's innovative plan called Action, addressing crime trends in our neighborhoods. Although we continue to be below provincial and international standards for the ratio of police to population, the intelligent redeployment of our officers has enabled us to begin to turn around the old perception that our downtown is not safe. So we are making great progress. But you can show all the improving crime stats that you want. If people don't feel safe, they will not venture downtown. So here's what Vice President Joe Biden said about policing in a major speech in Miami, Florida. The budget is a statement in numbers of what you actually value. Show me your budget and I'll show you what you value. There is a direct correlation between community safety and the number and presence of officers. This strategy, officer presence, will suppress violent crime in the community. We can't expect the continuing growth of our city to be achieved without the commensurate presence of adequate and effective policing. The success we've had in policing was based on innovation. And that may be the most powerful tool we have as a re-energized community. Farmers know about innovation, and our agricultural sector is approaching $2 billion in value to Hamilton's economy. Last week, I visited a dairy operation in Jerseyville that is spectacular by any measure. When the 700 cows arrive at the state-of-the-art barn, technology identifies them and tells the farmer how they are milking. Like one of our biggest concerns uh, as a nation is productivity. So typically, cows are milked twice daily. At this farm in Ancaster, they're milked three times daily. Do the math on productivity. The end result is the production from a farm in Hamilton of 14,000 liters of milk per day. And there is another dairy operation in Hamilton where because of their automated robotic processes, the cows come and go as they please and are milked when they please. And their production, it's 
the most amazing thing to see these cows wandering. Oh, I think I'll go in and get milk now. And uh, <laughs> I wish we could uh, show you that operation, but uh, innovation comes from research, and therein lies a key to Hamilton's future. The research that is going on in Hamilton has put us on the world stage. Any discussion about Hamilton's newfound dynamism has to include McMaster research led by President Patrick Dean and Vice President of Research and International Affairs, Mo Albastawi. Their work has flourished because of the strategic investments provided by such people as David Braley, Michael DeGroote, Charles Jurovinsky, Ron Joyce, so many others who've had successful careers in Hamilton and made the decision to reinvest in the future of our community and its people, and we thank them for that. Hamilton continues to have a robust future in manufacturing, yes, manufacturing, because we continue to make the transition into an advanced manufacturing economy. The key is to capture the economic value of the research we are conducting at McMaster and other places. There are a number of research areas in which McMaster University is recognized as a global leader, such as medicine, life sciences, and engineering. And these can generate enormous opportunities for collaboration and for business attraction and investment in Hamilton. Partnerships between researchers and industries can attract investment and create valuable, well-paying jobs. We in city government must stand prepared to do what is necessary to seize new opportunities like commercialization of research, where we are in fact, as I said, global leader, and that will require decisions on investment by city council. And these are decisions that can't be constantly put off. Although Hamilton is in the ascendancy, many of our residents continue to find themselves in need and crisis. Sadly, statistics show that about a quarter of our children live in families below the low income cutoff that is sometimes described as the poverty line. Hamilton's situation is typical of large Canadian cities. But because of the outstanding work and programs created by the staff of our Community Services Division and a vast network of community partners, we are working very hard to alleviate the effects of poverty among our residents. Over the past two years, our Ontario Works caseload has dropped by over 1,000 individuals. Our affordable housing waiting list stands at 4,700, but this pales in comparison to cities such as Toronto, where the list approaches 80,000. Our efforts are further augmented by our Neighbourhoods Initiative, which directly confronted the notion of marginalized areas by empowering hundreds of residents in the design and functioning and rejuvenation of the places where they live and where their kids go to school. The great things happening in our city, therefore, required us to challenge the status quo and find new ways of doing things. The old ways, the old attitudes left us in the doldrums. We fell behind other cities. Continuing with the old ways will only take us back to the decline of the past 20 years. As we head into a new year, it's a good time to embark on some new thinking. Past administrations were concerned with how to stop the bleeding, underscored by headline stories such as lament for a downtown and rotting in the core. Those days are over. With our newly found confidence, the bleeding has stopped and Hamilton needs to move away from past perceptions. We know we're on the right track because the rest of Canada is starting to take notice. And while it is great to bask in the praise we are finally starting to garner in out-of-town media and the like, it is so important that Hamiltonians and that includes all the people in this room in your role as community leaders is so important that all of us differentiate between constructive criticism and pure negativity. The word to go with the new Hamilton is confidence. We have it and we have to have it to keep us moving to greater levels of prosperity for all of our citizens and all of our businesses large and small. The confidence that will take us to the next level has to come from within. Confidence based on knowledge and understanding of the city and not idle skepticism.
To assist you in developing these talking points as you go among your friends and business associates, I invite you to visit my blog, MayorBratina.com, where we will post some of the material that I'm talking to you today in bullet point form, so you don't have to read the whole thing all over again. Uh, but I think it will help you to convey this hugely important message of our city. And let me close with this story. You will recall Peter Mansbridge was here last month for the Canadian Pacific Holiday Train event at Gage Park. Because of our support in the past, Hamilton was picked by Canadian Pacific from scores of cities, and they've got a tough manager, Hunter Harrison, and they picked Hamilton to be the eastern venue for an elaborate stage show, which featured Great Big C, Tom Cochran, Natalie McMaster, and it was a huge success. The biggest turnout of the three North American cities chosen attracting something close to 20,000 Hamiltonians. So Peter Mansbridge was the MC, and he had me on stage and asked me, what does it mean to be chosen as the site for this gala, and what does this great turnout say? And I said to him, it means it's okay again to be from Hamilton. And that drew huge applause that night. And while that applause was gratifying, it wasn't for me, it wasn't for the mayor, I saw it as an ovation for Hamilton and everyone who has contributed to our new reality. That includes the multi-million dollar commercial investments, but it also includes people who operate small shops or galleries, a bookstore on King East, a designer shop in Dundas, and perhaps most of all, those of us who have always loved Hamilton and never gave in to the naysayers, who fixed up their small homes and planted gardens, and who hoped that their children would find their future here. There are those in this room who can sign a $50 million check, and there are those who can't. And every one of us is a believer, every one of us has pride, every one of us has confidence. So please, my expectation for all of you as we leave this room today is to think of how you've contributed to where we are today and how we need to contribute to keep this momentum going. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in a unique place in the history of Hamilton. You have all contributed to what we see outside these magnificent windows. Thank you for that. And let's all hope that the Hamilton we know and love, this true destiny as a great Canadian city, will have returned once again. Thank you so much. Is the uh, the biggest business issue right now, or the biggest issue facing uh, businesses, the economy, um, and uh, what are you going to do to uh, to champion uh, those issues? And here I'll give you this. Uh, live within my means, because what businesses need is the ability to compete on a level playing field, and we have to be concerned about the cost of doing business in Hamilton whether it has to do with development charges, taxation, the time it takes to get uh, projects developed and moving, because time is money, of course. And as, as a matter of fact, when we look at the comparisons, we do very well in terms of, uh, despite the fact that we do get criticisms and, and we have to acknowledge, confront, and, and correct those things, that we are doing much better as a city in, in terms of moving development along than we have in the past. But there's more that we can do. But the first, the very first thing is to keep the tax base low and allow our businesses to compete. Okay, so um, that implicates, I, I think, uh, the city's open for business review in, in terms of uh, cutting out the red tape. Where are we in, uh, in that process and, and what more do we need to work on as a, uh, as a city? Well, we continue to work on it as a city. Uh, our, the things that I talked about show how well we are doing as a city. And so uh, staff is very aware of that from uh, Chris Murray through the Economic Development Department. And there isn't a day goes by that we don't consider how we can uh, expedite all of our processes for the reasons stated. Okay. Um, the uh, a lot of the the questions that uh, came out of my uh, my Twitter solicitation yesterday uh, had to do with transit uh, and LRT. Um, you've been on the uh, record in the past as uh, committing to working with all levels of government to secure funding for LRT. Um, you have uh, given your unequivocal support in the past. Do you still support LRT? And uh, where are we on that uh, on that issue? 
Well, I urge everyone to go to the other side of uh, the 21st floor and see the rapid ready presentation. The government, uh, the provincial government is well aware of uh, the city's position. Uh, and on the funding issue, of course, council uh, voted not to uh, accept the funding tools as were suggested in the past. Now, the Ann Golden report has changed a lot of that dynamic. But you have to understand that uh, the first iteration of the, the big move gave a sense that somehow a um, billion dollars would come forward for the creation of, uh, of an LRT. And it's, it's fairly obvious that at least a third of that money will come from the local community, which on a billion is over 300 million. So it becomes uh, a budget issue at some point. But in terms of where we are with LRT, it's very clear. It's outlined in Rapid Ready. We're going to build and enhance our, our ridership on HSR to the point where we can support uh, other uh, modalities such as light rail. Okay, uh, if we do get our LRT, uh, help us with uh, with what you think uh, the vision is uh, down the line. What do you think the, the impact of, of LRT uh, would be uh, to this community? Well, LRT is a, is a is kind of a buzzy thing right now and everybody seems to want LRT, but when you survey communities across North America, Winnipeg is bigger than Hamilton, has a denser population and higher uh, day of per capita ridership. We're very low on the ridership scale and that's why Don Hall and his group uh, have created a plan to build that ridership. And you don't build that ridership on one corridor, you build it all across the city, you make it easier for people. Uh, I made a reference about HSR connections in my speech to a, a GO service, which could actually be an, an HRT, which is heavy rail, um, uh, opportunity for people to move from the far east end of the city to the core. But uh, the fact is that we have to rationally approach this, and of course, we will have LRT in Hamilton at some point, at the right point in time in our history. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, if you do have a question for the mayor, we have uh, chamber staff circulating. Uh, so uh, just uh, hold up your, your question and we will have that, uh, have that picked up. Um, you mentioned uh, safety on our streets uh, from a, a crime angle. Um, and uh, you're right, the, the perception of Hamilton as an unsafe uh, downtown is absolutely wrong. Believe me, I lived in a lot of US cities. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, safety of pedestrian mobility and all of that, uh, if I could prove to you, and we're, we're working with the McMaster Institute of Transportation and Logistics to study the economic uh, impacts of, uh, of complete streets uh, in this community, if I could prove to you that that is an economic imperative and, uh, and a necessary predicate to creating a thriving downtown, how would you respond as a mayor and what would you do to, uh, to act upon that? Well, you don't have to convince me about complete streets. It, it's sensible, it's, uh, it's being uh, implemented in cities all over the world, and Hamilton's turn will come. But I have to go back to live within your means. Our annual deficit of infrastructure is $195 million. We have water mains that break, as they have in the cold weather, and then they break again. And so you have to overlay the, the complete streets against the cost of it and how you can sensibly and reasonably implement it. And, uh, and as an economic driver, so the argument would be, well, you, this will pay back. But how long will the payback be and, and what will other people be having to endure in terms of the infrastructure around their, their homes and their neighborhoods while some parts of the city uh, get this, uh, this new approach. So I would say that it's going to be an excellent discussion around the, uh, the budget table. And count, we're, we're uh, expecting a report back from our staff on complete streets. And so we'll go from there. But uh, we always have to be concerned, I always am anyway, about where the money's coming from. Uh, and given that, uh, we actually had a question last night um, uh, through Twitter as well, asking us, uh, given the, the deficit, uh, the infrastructural deficit, are 0% uh, or 1% or uh, increases uh, sustainable into the future? Well, we have to look at the, the cost, the, how we're spending money right now. 
And uh, for instance, the office of the mayor has a budget of about $1 million. And that budget has continued to grow since amalgamation. And, but the spending stopped in uh, 2011 because I've been able to run a very productive office. The, my speech ref speaks to that at about a third below that budget. And we, uh, I patterned after Hazel McCallion, who has four people in her staff. They have a population of about 700,000. That's about uh, the number of uh, dollars that it takes to run that office. So you can look roughly, not exactly, but about a dollar per capita to, to uh, run the mayor's office. We, we don't need, for instance, uh, policy analysts. Chris Murray's got a lot of smart people working for him. And all we had to really do to access that was to take the lock off the door that existed between the city manager's office and the mayor's office. There was a lock and only one person had the combination to get through that door. So we got rid of that. And we also got rid of about $300,000 a year in spending. That's one department. So before we get on to zero and how much we should increase taxes, let's continue to review, as we are, our processes and, and see where uh, we can save money. There may be something more on that uh, in the um, presentation this afternoon by Dr. Coban from the University of Western Ontario. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question from the audience. We talk a lot about how well we are doing to attract new business and construction, but what are we doing to grow existing business, particularly our small and medium-sized enterprises? Well, 80% uh, of your new business comes from your old business, and then everyone probably is aware of that. So what did we do? Well, Birmingham is an interesting uh, example. Birmingham was going to move. Uh, we found, uh, we enabled them to take over part of the old brewery, doubling the size of their operation. And so instead of losing 150 uh, well-paid employees, we kept them and allowed the company to grow. Bungie is the uh, soy processing factory down on uh, Burlington Street. And they uh, expanded, uh, did a $60 million expansion which is beautiful because the road's there, Burlington Street, the pipes are all in the ground, you just hook them up and, and away you go. And so we think that there's opportunities for them to grow as well. And for smaller businesses, the key there, and sometimes we still fumble that ball, it's to, it's to make it as seamless as possible, the one-stop shopping. Six months ago, we told a business owner, this is what you have to do to open up in January. So in January, you shouldn't be saying, oh, by the way, you've got an encroachment problem. So uh, this is the main thing, because smaller enterprises have less capital, less money to work with. And so if you're going to tell a guy who's building seven uh, townhouses and a little uh, site somewhere in the inner city infill, he doesn't have the ability to go, you know, redraw the whole plan because somebody's uh, idea has changed. So we have to be concerned. We have to understand the reason we're here is not for us to earn wages and go home and have a swimming pool. <laughs> the reason we're here is to help those people grow their businesses, which grows the city. Okay, you touched upon the, uh, the North End Industrial Corridor. I, uh, that was a major uh, tenant of your, uh, your platform your, for economic development. Tell us about uh, what's going on there, specifically uh, with regard to the Stelco lands. Stelco lands are uh, not in play for us because Stelco or U.S. Steel Canada. U.S. Steel Canada owns those lands and, uh, and, has, and they haven't told us uh, yet what their intentions are with regard to those lands. But there is a lot of land there and at some point uh, those lands will become productive again. One of the keys is the zoning of those lands which is K-heavy industry. And as much as some people hate smokestacks, uh, I don't. And smokestacks have changed since my father came here in 1928 and moved to a house right across the fence from, uh, from the DeFasco foundry because there's technology in those smokestacks. And I was meeting with, uh, when I met with Local 1005, we were talking about this whole issue. And there was a Chinese uh, delegation visiting the uh, U.S. Steel facility. And they looked at a, a machine and they said, the machine was new technology designed to take the particulate out of the air. 
which we've been doing for years, uh, ArcelorMittal de Fasco, when I was working there 50 years ago, we, they were installing electrostatic precipitators which uh, ionize the particles as they go out of the stack and collect them and you put them in a bag and, and dump them somewhere. So th these are just further technologies that are being implemented. So the Chinese guy says, why would you spend so much money just taking the dust out of the air? Well, if you've seen a picture of Beijing lately, you'll know why we do that. So our tech, our industry is continues to try to keep pace with the environmental requirements of the day. So. Uh, we, we go down Burlington Street, our K zoning, which is so vital to our, our manufacturing uh, potential. You have Birmingham construction at the end of Ferguson. Right next to Birmingham, you have $10 million of, of grain storage with uh, Parrish Heimbecker from Winnipeg. Uh, right next to that, you have Bungie with their advancing operation. Then you go uh, down the line. Uh, my favorite one is National Steel Car because that company used to have about 1,200 employees and they would be cyclical up and down with the, they did have a recent layoff for retooling, but they currently have over 2,000 employees and they have contracts for years ahead to build new railway cars because of the resurgence of the railway industry. So that given up for dead company is chugging along just fine. And right down into, and then when we get to the far east end of the industrial corridor, you have this incredible environmental project, the Windermere Basin Wetlands Project. Federal funding, the desire to uh, create a, a better environmental situation in the midst of heavy industry. So we're doing it both ways. It, you know, Denver, Colorado, Ogden, Utah, they can be you know, pristine and fresh air with no factories. But how about being an environmental leader with factories? That's what we're doing in Hamilton. Let's, uh, let's talk uh, about downtown again. Another question from the audience. What role does heritage preservation or adaptive reuse play in the uh, economic revitalization in Hamilton? Hamilton is attractive to so many people, especially new people coming from out of town. If you're coming from Toronto, it, even when I was there, I worked at CFRB in the mid 80s, it's changed so much and so much has, has been lost. I lived at Young and Eglinton and the little shoe store, the shoe repair that I used to go to, it disappeared overnight, you know, and all of a sudden the condo's going up. Well, we're not at that state yet, so we still have time. And it's interesting, it's like Eastern Europe, which lost uh, the momentum of the post-war years because of the communist, uh, because of the Iron Curtain. So cities like Prague and so many others didn't get the huge developments that took away their, their, their heritage. It's sort of the same with Hamilton, although we have lost so many valuable pieces. But there's no question, and the, the guy that owns this building is the biggest believer in that. And he, the owner of Yale Properties, has several buildings in Montreal, 1840, 1850 pre-Confederation, rubble foundations, ah, it's no problem, you prop them up, you know, you fix them up. He's been doing that. So that, that is uh, a wave that we can still capture and we have to be careful and I think we've done the right thing on the gore in holding up uh, the destruction of those old buildings on the south side of King Street. So to me, there's a great future and an important future in preservation of our heritage. Related to that, uh, another question we had uh, uh, last night via Twitter was, uh, and from my understanding, there's, there's a perverse incentive for uh, uh, creating a, a parking lot um, in downtown. Uh, do you have any, uh, any uh, uh, intention to lobby the provincial government to end tax breaks for, for empty lots? Lobby the provincial government to end tax breaks for parking lots. Uh, well, you need parking. Hamilton actually doesn't have enough parking, but I certainly didn't like what happened uh, recently when they tore down what looked to me like a functional building and turned it into a parking lot, which I understand from our staff is does not comply. And so it remains to be seen uh, how we're going to deal with that. But uh, parking is not evil. It just has to be done in the right way. And one of the problems that we have is our parking is too cheap. I remember arguing, and get this, the Ward 2 downtown councillor arguing with the downtown BIA and the International Village BIA that I'm embarrassed that we have 50 cent an hour parking meters. That's like Tilsonburg. 
you know, and the cars that are parked there are nice modern cars that are full of gas. And so if you can't afford a buck or two for parking, like why are you driving your car? So the meters did go up. We're still way below uh, where we should be. And the key to that is once you get your parking at the right cost, you can afford to build parking structures. So you don't have to take land out of play. And we've got tons of it. I mean, you take an aerial photo of the core. Though all of the city hall, I mean, the Board of Education, their big deal leaving was they needed parking. So uh, the way that you handle parking in urban settings is you, is you build structures. That's what we need to do. Okay, and a couple uh, more questions uh, and then we'll uh, end. Uh, if Hamilton has reached a tipping point, uh, who should be credited with its success? Well, it'd be me and... Uh, <laughs> 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 you know, the fact... We're at, a, a, we're at a congruence or a convergence or somebody else go down the thesaurus and pick a, a good word. So many good things are happening. It's, we're in the right place at the right time. There was inevitable that Toronto was going to get overbuilt and things would start moving our way. So then when things did start moving our way, people started looking around. And I think, you know, the Vrancourt projects, we were told by our local people, uh, there's no demand for condos and buildings downtown. Because they said, build downtown, there's no development charges. Oh, no, there's no demand. So. Somebody from out of town said, yeah, I think there's a demand. And now we've got, you know, 12-story, 25-story Jeff Pakin's uh, project. And he is a local guy, so he knows it. Uh, but it just, uh, people suddenly went like, Eureka, uh, I found it. Like, here's a great city. Look where the location is. So we have some problems that are going to keep us from continuing the growth, and one of them is transportation issues uh, between the American border at the Niagara River and here downtown. Probably our biggest problem, though, is uh, tweets and negativity. There's nothing wrong with our city. And who gets the credit for it? Go ahead, take the credit, everybody. It doesn't matter. Okay, final question. Um, what does Hamilton look like to you 10 years into the future? Ten years into the future, uh, if I'm looking down from my little helicopter hovering not too high, I see more families and children in the core. And that is the that is the best bellwether of how your city has grown. And, you know, it's great to see in, in cities like Boston and even Manhattan, you know, the kids are all trundling off to school. And that's why, you know, I'm really keen on keeping the, the schools that we have in the downtown core, and that's a whole other issue, and we don't need to get into that now. But, but if we do things right, and I was asked, I remember Joanne Pryle asked me this when I first started as a counselor, and she's forgotten she asked me this, but I remember the question. So what is it you want for the city? You know, why did you get in politics? And, you know, just a good question. And I said, I want people to be able to enjoy Hamilton the way I enjoyed Hamilton when I was a kid. And that's a long time ago because I'm in my 70th year. So that city that I grew up in was absolute magic. It hasn't been magic for the last 20 years, but magic is happening right now. So in 10 years, goodness knows, but I want the streets to be crowded and I want to see old people, young people, children, everybody taking advantage of what should be one of the greatest cities in Canada. That's what I expect to see.